This is Guy Spear, and you're listening to The Education of a Value Investor, documenting my ongoing quest for wealth, wisdom, and enlightenment. In this episode, I've asked my friend Georgina Godwin to interview Grant Schreiber, who is the publisher and editor of a magazine called Real Leaders. Through Real Leaders, Grant has covered some extraordinary personalities, including people like Oprah Winfrey, F.W. de Klerk, and many others. And he's also an extraordinary example of somebody who's had to move cultures. When I met him, Grant was living in Cape Town, South Africa. He now lives in Portland, Oregon. The way I met him was also a little unusual in that I started writing thank you notes to him. And at some point, he paid attention and got back in touch with me. And so when you start writing to people in an open and grateful way, what I've found is extraordinary what can come back to you. A little bit about Georgina Godwin. Georgina is also, like myself and Grant, a, uh, an African born in Southern Africa. And uh, she's been a radio personality doing work for Monocle and for the first Zimbabwean free radio station and the BBC and others. And she's a professional, whereas I'm an amateur. And uh, so she's going to be doing the interview. And I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Many thanks, Guy. Well, as you said, you and I and Grant Schreiber are all from the same part of the world. So, Grant, let's begin by you telling us a little bit about your early life there. I was born in the 1960s in South Africa. It was the height of apartheid. I grew up in a, a wealthy white neighborhood and went to an all boys, all white school, which today, of course, is a very rare thing. I grew up in a very divided society. And when I was about 15 or 16 years old, I was taken on a school outing to go to the local township just outside Cape Town. And for the very first time, I realized there was actually two worlds in the country, and it actually changed my life fundamentally from that point. I was asked to write an essay on it, and the essay was selected as one of the best from that trip and read out to the class. And it, it just had a profound influence on me that I was actually growing up in a very divided country. And from that point onwards, I sort of consciously and subconsciously decided that there was something wrong with the system and that I needed to do something to change it. And my work since then has always been around some kind of social impact. It wasn't all doom and gloom in South Africa. South Africa is an amazing country. The diversity is great. We've got beautiful natural mountains and beaches. We've got people who have empathy and who love life. Unfortunately, that doesn't always translate into a successful democracy like many other countries in the world. But I finished schooling in South Africa. I went to university for four years, University of Cape Town, from there, the social consciousness of what was going on in the country was accelerated, as it is at most universities, if you had to look at what's happening in the world right now, and decided at that point that I needed to look a little bit closely as to what my career might be around that. So I studied fine art, which isn't always the best career choice in life, but it certainly was a very interesting experience. And that taught me the value of connecting with people and the value of people in your life around connections. A lot of people say to you, a university career is not as valuable as a skills-based career where you learn something practical. But what university did for me in South Africa was firstly showed me the value of diversity and the diversity of thought and put me in touch with all kinds of interesting people. And my favorite expression to this day is still, it's people that will help you in life, not your resume. And that started at university in Cape Town, just being exposed to this variety of thought and variety of different cultures. I ended up living with my best friend at the time, who was a black guy from the local townships who lived together for three years, which in those days was actually illegal. You couldn't actually do that without getting into trouble. We used to speak on a daily basis. And there was a time in 1985 that I was conscripted to the white only military. And I decided that all my friends were going, but the main problem was that if I did go, there was a good chance I would meet my best friend over the barrel of a gun down the line because he was on the other side, if you wanted to call it that in those days, which of course is now the status quo. And so we debated it long and hard and, and I decided I just couldn't do it in good conscience. So I left the country for a few years and traveled around Europe 
diversified my, my thoughts and ideas even further from that. When I got back to South Africa, I decided to start a media company. And once again, my social conscience kicked in and I looked around and wondered what I could do to make a difference with media other than advertising, which seemed to be pushing the latest city golf cars and you know soap products. And I looked at the fact that South Africa has a huge HIV AIDS infection rate. Even to this day, it's around about 1,500 cases a day. So I joined forces with Jonathan Shapiro, who's a very well-known international cartoonist. And we decided to use photo comics to educate low literacy people about the dangers of HIV AIDS. So we took a, a medium that was seen as a very sort of trashy, low format for media, and we turned it into something that had educational and medical advice for mostly teenagers in the townships to convince them about best practice for HIV AIDS prevention. And I did that for about five years. Eventually just realized, as I have in the last couple of years, that what we did in South Africa and a lot of other people in South Africa around social causes and social impact was actually going global. You slowly started to seeing people realize that truth and reconciliation committees around the world were actually a good idea in places of conflict and that the gender rights that we had in South Africa or were creating in the 1990s were suddenly gaining traction in other parts of the world. And that's when I came across an opportunity to produce a magazine called Real Leaders and I joined forces with people in America, and that's where I am today. And I've been doing that for 10 years now. I mean, South Africa's always been a febrile place. How did that affect running a business there? It is tough. It's certainly one of those places where you've got to take social norms into consideration. And there's a big trend right now with B corporations and sustainable development goals for companies to get involved in social causes. South Africa was doing that in the 1980s, 1990s already. There were a lot of companies, individuals who were doing that. So I think from the early stage, people in South Africa realized that you need to actually look after communities and, and build companies based on social good rather than just for profit. I do think there's still you know, big problems in the country, especially in the banking section, where it's just not as regulated and in control as other parts of the world. But when it comes down to small and micro businesses, that's where the real magic lies. And there's plenty of creativity around people who are finding incredible ideas to do amazing things. I do think it's slightly overregulated. A lot of people I've spoken to in South Africa find it a very difficult place to do business. There's a lot of regulation, a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of red tape. And I do wish that the country would open itself up a little bit more to creating opportunistic projects for companies to want to invest in the country and to be there. There are times sometimes where you think that you're being punished for running a business in South Africa with the bureaucracy, but it's certainly a, a good place to be if you have social impact baked into the core of your business. Mm. How did the end of apartheid affect the business world? Well, there was a huge rush of inward investment. I think there was a lot of optimism in the world at that point, and a lot of companies and countries had been holding off until they saw a post-Nelson Mandela democratic government. So that did create a huge spike in inward investment. There was an upward trajectory for many years in South Africa. I think there's been a couple of missteps over the last decade, especially. Politics has a way of creeping into everything in a bad way. I think what we're seeing in America today, South Africa went through many years ago. And as I said earlier, it's, there's a lot of things that started in South Africa. Well, we didn't invent it, but it was very prominent in South Africa many years ago that is now a global phenomenon. I just wanted to talk about your books for a moment. First of all, for any non-Southern Africans like us, I think you'll have to define the term cuck. <laughs> uh, cuck basically means shit. And it's, uh, it's, it's seen as more of a humorous word in South Africa than as an insult. So if you use that word against somebody, it's only half taken as an insult. It's not as rude as the F word or, or shit. But I looked around the country about 10 years ago and realized that the Rainbow Nation, as we were once called, was turning gray. Things were starting to slide backwards. Racial tension was cropping up again. And the dream that Nelson Mandela had painted for us was fading slightly. And everyone was moaning about everything. And it got so bad that people were moaning from, you know, queues to their drive and commute to work in the morning, to the situation at the office, to the state of politics, to the state of sport. So I decided to write this book and I called it, Is It Just Me or Is Everything Cuck? Which was a humorous take on, you know, 
being a pessimist in South Africa, and it was the A to Z listing of everything that basically pissed you off. And it became a bestseller. I realized that sometimes humor is the best medicine, that if you can laugh at yourself, that's the beginning of healing. And so I took on everyone, black and white, across the political spectrum, and people really enjoyed it on, on all sides. I followed it up with another book called Is It Just Me or Was Everything Still Cuck? Just in case you thought things had improved, <laughs> which they hadn't. And that also became a bestseller. It was a case of just trying to get people to, you know, people say many a truth said in jest. And I wanted to get serious topics across in a lighthearted way that people could, could relate to. And all the things I had in my book were simple, everyday South African instances that they could laugh at and say, yes, that was me today, or I saw that happening, and just recognize it. And I think recognizing it is the first step in healing it. You clearly have a great love for the country. Why did you leave? I have two young boys, and I just wanted to get them to be plugged into a bigger economy. I wanted them to become global citizens. So the lessons I learned around diversity in South Africa, I wanted to apply on a global level. So I try and expose them to as many travels and as many cultures as I can around the world. You know, we still love South Africa and we miss it and we want to go back all the time. But it's a case of looking at how I can get my kids to turn into global citizens with a global view. Dynamics have shifted around the world. China is an economic force to be reckoned with. There are amazing things happening in Latin America, things happening in Europe. I want my kids to be educated on those type of things and to have a worldview. Because I think keeping yourself confined mentally in a single country is not good for business these days. I think there's opportunity anywhere. And that's been proved through many of the stories that I find for Real Leaders magazine. Opportunities in very unusual places. The old go to university, go to business school, find a job and stick to one sector is almost dormant. People are building multi-million dollar companies out of nothing these days and just a, an idea that they happen to see on the side of the road on the way to work. So I'm trying to keep my kids' minds expansive and looking at opportunities globally. Just to reflect on what's happening right now, of course, you're in Portland, Oregon, and that is really the epicentre at the moment of the whole Black Lives Matter movement. It feels very much like South Africa right now, to be honest. You know, you thought you'd, you'd left these things behind and here you are in America looking at the same divisions, the same polarization, and the same issues. And just realizing that America might be so far advanced economically, it might be the most powerful nation on earth, but there's still fundamental issues here which need to be resolved. And on top of that, you have a, a huge population here compared to South Africa. South Africa's population, I think, is around 57 million. And here you've got 260 million people. So that the difference in thought is much bigger and the one thing that I feel good about is that people like to see America as a Republican Democrat divide, when in fact, there's so much diversity of thought here. One of the things I like about America is you can find your tribe very easily. And South Africa is pretty clear cut. You can usually tell in talking with somebody what values they ascribe to, what they're all about. And in America, it's much more confusing. You have no idea what's inside somebody's head as you do with most people around the world, but in America, even more so, I find it very fascinating that you will find a group of a thousand people that believe in some very bizarre theory, and then you'll find another group of 5,000 people who are just like you in all ways. And people are trying to make out as though America is a single unified identity. It calls itself the United States, but Sometimes the word united doesn't really apply. It looks very div divisive right now. But you, you will find your tribe. There's enough people here who think differently for, I think, democracy to continue and survive. Whereas I find in South Africa, things can get swamped with the status quo. And I think the way America's political system has been set up is very healthy because it allows for checks and balances for power not to be too concentrated in one place. Let's focus on Real Leaders now, the, the magazine. So you founded it. It's the world's first sustainable leadership and business publication. You founded it in 2010. It has a huge readership across a, a global spread. It was launched as a, a mainstream newsstand title in New York in 2017. So tell us more about the organ, if you like. I'm the founding editor of Real Leaders. I co-founded the magazine in 2010 with partners here in the U.S., we looked around and decided that the world is right for 
a magazine that was going to be telling positive, uplifting stories around business that works for people and planet. At the time, the word sustainability was very rare. People didn't even understand what it meant. It sounded like some kind of agricultural term around harvesting and you know retilling the land and rejuvenating. People didn't understand that it could actually apply to business. So we set out to create a magazine that would talk about businesses that were doing good in the world. And the most important part that defined us from charity and philanthropy was the fact that we wanted to show that you could make money while doing it. We didn't want to look like another charity. It wasn't a one-way giving. It was a, a two-way conversation. And it was also about how you got that philanthropy mentality installed into the main frame of your business. So it wasn't just doing good for the sake of it and then leaving it at that. It was actually seeing how it could become an ongoing profitable business. So we started off as a in-house magazine for the Young Presidents Organization, YPO, which is a global network of CEOs and presidents in 130 countries. And we did that for about six years. And at that time, we looked around and realized that this idea was going mainstream. And we decided to test it on the newsstand. So in September 2017, we launched the magazine onto newsstands across the US and globally. And we became the world's first mainstream sustainability leadership and business magazine. We try and focus on the good that companies and individuals are doing. And we try and raise the profile of companies that realize that social impact is the future. And increasingly with millennials and other generations, you're seeing brands being supported and being rewarded for thinking like that. You can't get away with creating a t-shirt that's got slave labor embedded in the supply chain. You can't get away with unhealthy products in food. Everyone's watching and it's a lot more transparent than it was 10, 20 years ago. So we are looking at raising those companies up as examples and hoping that others will follow. The title itself, Real Leaders, implies that perhaps there are unreal leaders, that there are fake leaders. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Firstly, I need to say that we're at great pains to not become political. We are non-partisan, non-political, independently funded. There's no lobby group behind us. We're not trying to push any agenda. We're simply looking at the good of business around the world. I did have funny looks in Davos one year when I had one of the directors of Siemens in Germany take my business card and say, real leaders, real, real leaders, real leaders. And, you know, we had a bit of a laugh about it. You're sitting among the world's leaders in Davos and you're calling yourself real leaders. Some of them were a little confused as to what our agenda was, but we're certainly not running for office or trying to gain power in any country or, or in any way. It's simply just a case of looking at a real leader to us is somebody who is community-minded, cares about the environment and cares about fair practices and that's already been formalized by things like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so a few years ago, we took those 17 goals and adopted them as an editorial template. So in every magazine, we try and look at how we can actually incorporate some of those ideas into the magazine. So we'll have health and well-being, we'll have life on land, we'll have life below water. And just to let people realize that even if they're in Central America and have never seen the ocean before, that the ocean still is important in terms of the bigger scheme of things. And even if you're a business person in Central America who's never seen the ocean, that things in the ocean can affect your bottom line in some way, someday, through climate change or through supply chains and things like that. So we try and raise up somebody as a real leader who is switched on to what's happening in the world and has a global view about what's going on and that all things are connected in some way. And what format does that take? Is it largely interview based? It is, yes. We do lots of interviews with notable people around the world. We do podcasts. We have a very active website, real-leaders.com. And what we've done more recently is swing our attention towards coronavirus and how businesses are thriving during crisis. Well, not thriving, surviving. Some are thriving. There's certain sectors have actually benefited from coronavirus. But we've been looking at how we can actually offer solutions. I think one of the important things with a real leader is that you, you roll with the punches and that when obstacles arise, you need to find a way around it and a solution. So increasingly over the last few months, we've been looking at a real leader as being somebody who steps up and who sees this as a crisis, first and foremost, but secondly, as an opportunity to convert or change their business towards the new need in the world. Tell us about some of the subjects covered by those real leaders. 
A lot of them look at their supply chains in terms of what kind of effect it's having on the environment. A lot of people are very concerned about their CO2 emissions and how they can cut that down. That's been solved by moving production facilities closer to labor force, uh, looking at producing things locally rather than importing. We've done stories with Unilever before, with Paul Pullman, who's obviously a seasoned veteran. He's left Unilever now, but he's still continuing the good work he did at Unilever, of looking at things like water shortages in China, where they realized that they needed to develop a new type of waterless shampoo because the water table had dropped dramatically in the five years that Unilever had been in this one city. And they decided, instead of getting involved in water conservation, they were clever enough to realize that people are using too much water in the shower to wash their hair. So they developed a new type of shampoo, which saved water. So it was a very ingenious way of introducing a new idea into a product that had nothing to do with water conservation directly, but it did have an effect indirectly. So that's the kind of solution that people are coming up with. It takes a bit of sideways thinking to come up with a solution. Yeah, it's still an, an imprint publication as well as digital. Just tell me a little bit about sort of typography and paper and that side of it. Are you very involved with the actual production of the magazine? Yes, I am. We've actually just moved our production locally to Portland, Oregon. And one of the main reasons for that was we have a paper mill here that produces paper out of straw. What the farmers do in most wheat fields around the world is when they've finished harvesting and they've got the stalks, they just toss a match on it and burn it because tilling it is too time consuming and too costly. It's much easier just to do a controlled burn. This releases huge amounts of smoke and CO2 into the atmosphere. We have partnered with this company here in Portland, Oregon, a paper mill that actually takes that waste straw and uses it to create paper. So what we've done, we have 16 pages of our magazine that is printed on the straw paper. It's a percentage of straw, it's not 100% straw. 100% straw paper is very yellow which is not great for reading, but it's a great first start. We have recycled agricultural waste in there as well, and we're moving the magazine completely to 100% organic, sustainable process in the near future. But a good start has been looking at how we actually use straw that would be burnt in our magazine. One of the things, of course, is that I need to put out the way is a lot of people have a sort of myth of when they pick up paper, they think that a part of the Amazonian rainforest has been destroyed. And... There are forests around the world that are specially grown. So if you think of a wheat field that's growing wheat, there are fields that grow trees. And that same field gets planted again and again and again with trees. They get harvested, they get used for pulp and paper, and then they get replanted again. And just outside Cape Town, where I'm from, sappy paper had huge plantations. They're one of the biggest paper suppliers in the world. They had huge plantations, and every couple of months when I would drive past, you would see the trees being chopped down and they would be planted again. And a few years later, they'd be, be harvested. So if people could see trees as a crop in certain situations, I think that would be more helpful. And my favorite metaphor is, you know, try dropping a, a cell phone into a bucket of water and a magazine into a bucket of water and come back after a week and see which one's dissolved. A lot of people are, are very fixated on digital as a solution. I'm a huge fan of digital. It's the future and it's the way everything's going. But in terms of sustainability, I do think the contents of the digital devices we use on a daily basis need to be examined a little closer. And I do think the situation with how trees are used for paper products should also be recognized as well. Where will you take the magazine next? We are actually moving increasingly towards an online edition. We are in newsstands across the US. We're in first class lounges and we're on newsstands at Barnes & Noble and other high profile airport distributors. So I don't think that's going away. What we've realized is that as much as people said magazines were going to be dead in a couple of years, they actually haven't gone anywhere. And the reason why we're introducing straw paper into the magazine is because a magazine is a tangible product. And I like to see it as any other product on a shelf. It's not just about disseminating information anymore. You can get that on your phone instantly. But when you're holding something, it feels good. It becomes a luxury product. So we're going to be keeping the, the print edition alive. And we're increasingly looking at how we, we pull in a, a membership base online through digital assets. And what about your own future plans? Well, I'll be here to stay in the US. I think this is where the opportunity lies. I'm particularly excited about you know, America being a, a place of innovation. And that's one of the key things that has never gone away in, in the US. Regardless of the crises it's been through in the past, I think people bounce back. There seems to be a tenacity here, which people don't let go of. 
so I'll be staying in the US and I have a global view already. So already I feel like I could be working anywhere in the world. That's the nature of, of media. You don't have to be located in one place all the time. I do interviews increasingly over Zoom. It used to be in person, less so with the coronavirus. But um, yes, I think, as I said earlier, that digital is the future of, of media and production. We'll be doing a blended combination of digital and print. So, Grant, just before we end, this conversation has been set up by our mutual friend, Guy Spear. And of course, networking is something that's incredibly important in, in both the business and in the media world. Yes, that's right. Guy reached out to me many years ago. I started getting Christmas cards and then I got invitations to events. And then he sent me a copy of his book. And I looked at this and thought, well, this is great. He's one of those super connectors and influencers who likes to stay in touch with people. And eventually I got an invitation from him to meet with former South African president F.W. Clerk in Zurich. I phoned him up and I said, sounds great. You know, have you got a place for me to stay? He was a little shocked at first, but um, he said, sure, I have a basement. So within a few weeks, I was in Zurich and staying in Guy's basement. We met with F.W. de Klerk and we ended up becoming really good friends. And it just made me realize the value of that personal connection. There's so many emails and, and uh, emailers and you know, bland and personal things that go out these days, which don't actually, you know, you look at it and pass it by because it's not speaking directly to you. But Guy is one of those rare people who's managed to get the communications right in terms of how he deals with people. He makes it really personal. And I think that's why he's got such an amazingly influential big network. But it's also how he manages to open doors for people. I think it's a lesson for business to always keep that personal aspect of your brand in mind is to not become too impersonal. You've got to know who your customers are. You've got to know who you're speaking to in a very intimate way. And I think that's where the value comes from. Grant Schreiber, many thanks for that. And to Guy Spear for the opportunity to have this conversation. 